Welcome to The Spawn Chunks, episode number 158 for Monday, September 13th, 2021. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me as always is my friend Johnny, but you may know him better as Smooth Gliding Pixel Riffs. Hello, sir. Hello. Smooth Gliding is basically the opposite of what has happened to Joel this weekend. If you're interested in learning a little <laughs> bit more about Joel's turbulent re-entry into No Man's Sky, you can hear more about that in The Render Distance. That is the extended version of the podcast that you can get from joining up to our Patreon at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. A little bit of pre- and post-show chat every week to ease us into the show uh so obviously no man's sky has not been super kind to you but uh hopefully you've been able to avoid the toxic rains of minecraft while you're uh, working on the citadel what's new oh man don't even say toxic rain of minecraft we don't want that we don't <laughs> we don't need not. that i am going to bombard our chat with all of the photos that i took uh on the citadel this weekend because i am really proud of the way that this turned out there's even a before and after of the stone church courtyard uh, i started it last weekend uh on one stream after doing something else i think and uh now i took another two or three streams to finish it up and what was nice about this experience as i just kind of clued in at the end of yesterday is that while the entire courtyard we would be considered like one area of the town that is now finished basically i filled it with a bunch of micro builds right there's beehives a rose garden wood pile staircases a raised path a raised vegetable bed gravestones the vicar's cottage the vicar's cottage probably being the largest of all these kind of like little mini builds in there um but all together they all now kind of feel pretty cohesive and and really have changed the dirt <laughs> back lot mm -hmm. of this of this uh stone church into something a lot more vibrant and a lot more useful and to the point where i kind of feel like weirdly it feels less like a medieval town now like i feel like the medieval town needs a little bit more mud <laughs> yeah so i need to i need to figure out what i'm going to do from an, an aesthetic standpoint with the rest of the town because the cobblestone streets now feel pretty barren so i don't know whether that means just adding the odd bush here and there maybe doing more moss and 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 bush on the roofs of things but i need to add something more to the medieval town outside the church so that the church doesn't look like this weird oasis in the middle of yeah of of stone and, and dirt um not that the buildings aren't attractive but i just because i've added so much color i think with the build uh there needs to be a little bit more going on um but i'm really happy with it it was a lot of fun to kind of like not build another house like it was nice to say like i'm just to this this week i'm just going to focus on the beehives i'm going to get down to the nitty gritty as i'm sure you probably know when you get into the details of these kind of things they take just as long i can take three hours and build an entire building or i can take three hours and build half of a church courtyard yeah yeah <laughs> because you're noodling with like you know beehives what position they're in how do i make what looks like an awning out of courts and and fences and have it look believable uh you know the the details and nuances of texturing a path making sure it doesn't look like a checkerboard, like all that kind of stuff uh, comes into play. I do have the advantage of having a custom coarse dirt texture that has like gravel in it mm -hmm. here and there, which which helps break things up a bit. But uh, I'm really happy with it. It's It shows off some of my custom vegetable textures too. I have a custom beetroot and a custom wheat and a custom potato texture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think carrots are the only thing that are vanilla. And um, it's it really it really came together nicely. Uh, love the fact that I remembered that you can put grass on coarse dirt, so you don't have to have just like a big green block. You can actually have just a little bit of green, like on like the some entity ground. grass rather than the, yeah, the grass yes. block. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. Uh, moss carpets have been an absolute dream for edging a path to give it a real edge, like a real pixel geometric edge mm -hmm. when you want it to look solid. Uh, the only thing that I think I feel is missing uh right now is the inability to put grass on something like a mossy cobble block or a mossy brick block like yeah, i really yeah. wish you could have grass punching up through um the stone blocks not all stone blocks just i feel like if it's got a green bit in it you should be able to put grass on it uh, the closest you can come is of course mossy carpet but then of course that covers up the texture of the block underneath so um, but yeah, I, I, I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I had a lot of interesting conversations with chat about what I was trying to do in terms of guiding the player, guiding the path of the eye around the courtyard, what we were going to do about lighting. Uh, I feel like there was, um, a lot of color conversation in terms of contrast, in terms of, um, trying to find the right 
color temperature blocks because people were saying like, oh my gosh, like I've never thought about using acacia at the end of a stone path. And I was like, you can, but it usually works better when you're leading into something warm. So like going from a gray stone path, which is pretty neutral, into a warm brown path, which is dirt and wood and stuff like that. Acacia works because acacia is a warm gray. Whereas if you use something like uh, basalt, basalt has like a real purple to it. You don't notice it at first, but when you lay it down, you realize, oh, that doesn't match the dirt at all. And it's interesting to see how different color temperatures and different blocks kind of affect what kind of dithering effect you can kind of work in. And that remains to be challenging at the player scale that I'm working at, because like, again, the path is three blocks wide at most. So when you're adding texture, a little goes a long way before it starts to look like a chessboard. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I haven't seen like a full overhead shot of this city for a while. And how much have you started putting like elements like trees throughout the rest of the town because if you're starting to find that everything gets a little bit too gray and the streets look kind of barren i honestly think throwing a few trees in there is not a bad call so i haven't done any there's i think one there's one spot where there's a mossy bit on a roof mm -hmm. and there's another spot anytime i've got a wall like up against the wall i'll do a vine going up the wall from here and there but i don't think i have i don't even think i have a spot for a tree like yeah. i'm not sure where i would put one because i uh, i think i think honestly in terms of medieval cities you you tend to expect that in order to get building materials locally for some of the houses and stuff they would just clear cut all of the trees in the area but i honestly think while we don't necessarily consider those like the types of places that would have like public parks and stuff like that there are still going to be in world trees that they either didn't want to cut down were too big to cut down so they decided mm -hmm. to leave them there or maybe trees that felt like you know this would be a good place for you know a few benches and and a, a small kind of public area that they could have a market around kind of in the same way that uh, last time you showed us the well that was kind of in the center of that courtyard area. I feel like trees in areas like that would make a pretty good addition if you want to break up the streets a little bit more. And it's something I've been doing in my desert town that's slowly developing on the Empire's server is putting trees just up, growing up against walls and stuff like that as well, especially where the wall looks a little bit more plain, but I don't want to add too much texture to it because the detailing takes time and I'm trying to expand the overall footprint of the town quite quickly i think adding a tree here and there just either growing up against a wall or maybe sticking out a little bit so it cuts the path in half and you can choose whether to go around it to the left or to the right really makes a difference and looking at overhead shots of medieval cities both in terms of concept art for video games and in real life like i found a picture of the walled town of carcassonne in france and that's got trees everywhere if you look at it from a bird's eye view they're on mm, you know the average mm -hmm. street and in between the houses maybe in a couple of gardens and things like that but i think it adds something to that environment in the same way that your churchyard really pops out as something more vibrant because it's got all of that green in there it's got the grass to break up how gray the paths are everywhere else so i think trees might be the, the way forward for that and I did add a custom tree at the back of the church, which was a suggestion from the chat, just because we were looking at this one spot. We're like, do I just put another bush here? Like we've done bushes all the way around the church. Like what could be a little bit different here? And we did have the room to have the tree kind of like go out over the the graves at the back and cast a little bit of a more of an interesting shadow. So that's a really good point. I want, I'm just trying to think like I can maybe make that a priority as I do the east side of town because the east side of town is meant to have like the slightly rich, richer people you know more residential more gardens more more space for that kind of stuff the market area which is what i've been working on i i think unfortunately in the planning i just didn't leave a lot of room mm -hmm. but i'm i'm wondering where i'm wondering if there's a spot that i can punch out that has previously been paved i could say like i could just unpave this i could just like remove this and say that there should be a tree here or even if it's just something as small as like a i'm not sure what i could even do but i just i feel like there needs to be there needs to be just a little bit more hanging around even if it's something that is like a cart filled with flowers you know like it, like a someone that would wheel it down the road you know that's filled with vegetables or filled with something that's not gray <laughs> or brown yeah. then i think that that could help too that might be an easier way to get in there too like maybe have like a 
uh, I don't know, like a, a barrel full of bushes or I don't know, I could figure something out. But yeah, if I could find more spaces for trees, then I will absolutely do it because that that definitely helped uh, the the church. The, the thing that I'm always concerned about outside the walls is putting trees too close to the wall, then compromising the fact that there's a wall there. You know, like if people mm -hmm. can just climb the tree and climb the wall, then, then why did you build, why did you build the wall in the yeah, first place? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's I feel like almost an essential thing for a churchyard to have a tree in it because like n knowing you know the the english kind of medieval traditions and and uh, a lot of churches in this country dating back a very long way they would always have a yew tree in the churchyard and it has some symbology within like the christian church but it is also just like nice to have some trees around there for shelter if people are visiting the churchyard and it rains you know there's there's stuff like that that just being able to stand underneath a tree in a churchyard for shade or for shelter or something like that seems like a, a pretty logical thing to have there so i think that's uh, definitely a good call by the chat and uh, yeah probably worth considering i know custom trees can be a bit of a pain to do sometimes especially with the the level of detail that you want to get out of them versus the player scale that you're working with but yeah yeah i think i think trees might be a good ad for other spots in the town if you can find places to put them i i did get pretty much what i wanted with that custom tree uh inspired by the shape of azaleas i didn't grow an azalea but i just kind of like went inspired by one yeah i used azalea leaves but a fun trick that i discovered on the weekend is using jungle leaves as dark azalea so like they're just they're the same kind of hue but they're just a little bit darker mm -hmm. and so you can put a jungle leaf underneath an azalea leaf or in the middle of a tree and it just looks deeper rather than uh rather than the same texture plus because it's a different texture if you line up the camera with two blocks you can't see straight through them you know mm -hmm. yeah uh, which is cool so if people want to mess around with custom trees try mixing up your leaf type i used to do uh, birch and oak together with birch being the dark and oak being the lighter one and they're they're okay but they're they're pretty dissimilar um, but jungle and acacia are very close and and kind of give a nice mix uh, so that's been fun to play with as well so besides trees what's what's new in your desert town um, I've actually been spending some time away from the desert town for storyline purposes, although I think I, I've, I've made my return officially as of now. Um, but while I was away, I built a ghast farm on the nether roof. This is Nembon's uh, portal-based nether roof ghast farm. And it's not my first ghast farm ever because I built one in Skyblock a while ago, but obviously because Skyblock is a void world, both in the nether and the overworld, it's a little bit easier to make a very efficient farm there. You can build the spawning platform at the bottom of the world. And what I did was... Uh, built a farm that allowed me to take advantage of looting so I'd have my looting sword in my offhand bow in main hand or, or whichever way around you're supposed to do it I, I forget but I did it the right way uh, and I'd just be able to shoot down through open blocks in like a glass ceiling that was on the thing so the ghasts couldn't float around there was enough room for them to spawn but not move and then I would just shoot downwards onto them in this case though the portal based ghast farm effectively frees up the mob cap immediately and frees up the spawning potential for that area by teleporting them through a bunch of portals into the overworld. It's a farm design that's been used pretty heavily on servers like Hermitcraft. People might be familiar with that. Um, my first time building one of these and having used it for, I guess, a couple of hours of AFK time, I would definitely recommend it as an alternative to a creeper farm if you want just gunpowder. Obviously, you get ghast tiers as well and you don't get any of the other mob drops that you get from a more general mob farm but it fills up two double chests in less than an hour and about two wow. thirds of that is gunpowder because of course there's going to be you know, a decent amount of ghast tears um it has the advantage that both ghast tears and gunpowder will drop from ghasts even if a player doesn't kill them so you get all the drops you could potentially get and the the main disadvantage really is the amount of prep time that goes into it because of the amount of obsidian you need to make all those portals um, so what I ended up doing was taking down basically the largest and tallest of the obsidian pillars from the end dimension all the way down to the height of the island itself and that got me about 4,000 obsidian. It maybe took five or six hours but I had some podcasts I could play in the background and all I was doing was getting to the top of the pillar uh, holding down left click and using the trick where you press F3 and T to reload the textures and then it keeps you left clicking. So it basically like locks off the left click function as, a, as almost like an auto clicker. And so I was doing that just repeatedly with sets of two blocks at a time, like looking at one block, mining the block below me and then mining the block next to it. 
and so that way i was able to gather all of the obsidian with relatively little effort and concentration uh, so i could just zone out and read twitter and things like that and then building it up into a ghast farm took the length of about a stream it was about three hours and at a decent afk height so that you don't load any new hostile mobs into the nether cavern below the roof it's weapons grade it works super well um, and so hats off to Nembon for doing the research that went into the video. His video on it is very in-depth when it comes to spawning mechanics and other methods he's considered and ultimately relying on this portal-based method to get ghasts into the overworld. They spawn in a regular size nether portal, so as long as there's a couple of blocks around them to make sure they don't just fly out of there, they suffocate in the obsidian of the portal in the overworld and the drops just fall into water and get traveled into one of the hoppers so it's it's a very simple farm to set up as long as you can spare the time to get the materials and has been really really effective for me so far that sounds really cool i uh i'm still hesitant to unlock like giant air quotes the roof of the nether yeah on the uh -huh. citadel. that's that's the other, the other consideration yeah. besides the obsidian i think yeah yeah, we've got everything right now. Even our gold farm, which is very efficient in terms of, especially for repairs. I'm not sure how much gold we're getting, but like we can we can repair stuff in minutes uh, at the pigman farm, uh, pig, a zombified piglin. It's faster than the ender ender. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I, I don't know what I did wrong, but my ender ender is like molasses. It's super slow. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, something that we've just not. I I don't think we can reach a consensus on on the sigil to go above above the nether. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's it's one of those things that it just depends on your play styles and, and what everybody else on the server agrees with. Um, you certainly don't need to build a farm like this because more often than not, you don't need that amount of gas tiers and gunpowder can be acquired in a number of different ways. So it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be for everybody, but in this case, because somebody else on this server, this is on the Empire server where we are kind of claiming different types of farms to build and so somebody has had a mob farm a, a more general mob farm and a creeper specific farm for a while i felt like i had to provide an alternative design of farm even if i was getting the same stuff and so the right. ghast farm kind of made sense because it's not something somebody else has already done um and i think later on we're probably going to end up joining forces and having like a gunpowder based alliance <laughs> at some stage but um yeah it, it made for something a little bit more interesting and something that the server didn't have already so uh it felt like it was it was worth a try you have to build these in a soul sand valley biome because of the increased chance of ghast spawn rates and the only other thing spawning there being skeletons um, I think if you tried to build this in the nether cavern, you could, but apparently the spawning potential of ghasts can be blocked by there being striders in the lava lakes nearby. So I don't know how you would get on with building one of these in the nether cavern itself. I certainly think it's possible, I just don't know if you'd see the same sort of spawn rates and the same consistency, and especially you'd have to consider spawn proofing the area in the same fashion that you would a nether cavern gold farm. So it can be potentially a lot more work for you that way that's why the, the nether roof appeals to everybody for building farms of course but um yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the the potential this has for us crafting end crystals and doing fun stuff decorating with those we're probably not going to use them as weapons or anything because we have too many nice builds that we don't want to blow up but it's going to be uh fun to see where all of that goes and having the gunpowder is really nice because i've been intentionally depriving myself of gunpowder and get using riptide to fly around with elytra and avoiding using firework rockets so now i have access to those it offers a little bit more freedom a little bit more convenience for me getting around the server as well uh which is useful because the other thing i've been doing is gathering mob heads using charged creepers which is a fun time <laughs> it's uh it's a lot of fun be being able to trigger a thunderstorm now with the thunder shrine data pack from vanilla tweaks i am now able to sacrifice a totem of undying to make a thunderstorm anywhere anytime i want to and outside of the desert biome where I have my base, obviously I can strike anything with lightning. Lightning doesn't happen in deserts is something that I've recently been reminded of. Um, but then me and Catherine Elizabeth, one of the other folks on the server, went out to a plains biome near my base and she was chucking the channeling trident to any creepers that we could see. And then I was running up to them blocking with a shield and whatever mobs they blew up around me, we got at least one mob head from. 
And so that's been a bit of fun. I probably will end up making a more organized farm for that in future if we want to get more than just a couple of mob heads. But we got a creeper head, we got a zombie head, a skeleton head, all of the ones that we can't get just straight up from the, the mob heads data pack. And uh, at one point I got severely blown up, um, but that was because I didn't have my shield on me at that point. So I, the shield had taken so much damage that it broke and I just thought, yeah, whatever, I'll, I'll get myself blown up in the name of just having a bit of fun. And it's, it's a very, very fun time, as long as you don't end up losing any items from it, at least, which is something I know the pain of. But this time, uh, luckily, none of that happened. I don't do enough with mob heads. We have the data pack from t Vanilla Tweaks on the mm -hmm. Citadel as well. And uh, I have more drowned dr uh, heads that I know what to do with Same. after the, yeah. the drowned farm. Um, but I would like to have more like, because do you even get zombie heads and skeleton heads? Or do you have to, does that not include in the pack? You have Th to those, use... those are the ones that exclusively come from lightning strikes. They preserved right. that mechanic when they made the, uh, the, the data pack. pack. Yeah, because I, I would love to have not because I, I don't necessarily want to waste wither skeleton skulls because I don't have that many of them but like mm -hmm. I would love to have as I switch gears or thinking ahead like I want to try and do something dark and evil and I'm thinking like you know a bunch of zombie and skeleton heads on on pikes leading up to some mm -hmm. evil palace would be really cool but then I think like well where am I going to get all those yeah because um, I've I've noticed too um, we have the wandering trader mini block um, data pack on the server as well and I don't use it all the time, but boy, am I glad that when I see a wandering trader, I kind of peruse the wares and say, you know what? That mini log might come in handy down the line or, oh, that little mini beehive probably going to look pretty cool somewhere. And uh, I don't use them a lot just because, again, even though it's a data pack, we're trying to maintain that vanilla feel. Um, but once in a while, just putting that block down at a slightly askew angle just adds so much life to an area. And uh, having heads uh, for mobs, because I, I know that I don't know, remember where I got it, but there's a, a piglin head above my storage room in the nether just mm -hmm. because they were annoying the crap out of me. And I eventually just said, all right, we're done. Yeah. And I, I ended their annoyance. And then I said, as a warning to all other piglins that decide to roam my storage room, please note your friend above the door. Yeah. <laughs> <Like> just... <laughs> There's a lot of fun to be had with them, even though they are a little bit morbid when it comes to, especially if it's like, you know, pigs and cows and rabbits and stuff. Like it's a little, mm -hmm. it's a little bit strange, but uh, yeah, I, it's a fun mechanic to mess around with. Another bit of fun you can have with mob heads is that much the same as it works, I believe, with, uh, with the skeletons. If you're wearing a creeper head or a zombie head and you go near the corresponding type of mob, it actually gives you a certain amount of camouflage. Like you can oh, get right. you can get closer to a creeper wearing a creeper head and it will take longer to spot you in the same way that an invisibility potion works on on those mobs in particular. It won't conceal you completely because if they notice that you're around, then they'll they'll get wind of you and they'll realize that there's something there they can aggro on. But you can get closer and if you sneak, then that increases the chance. And so, um, yeah, there is actually mechanics tied to those, unlike the data pack versions, which I don't believe affect things at all because they're effectively just custom player heads, right? Um, so I think that's that's a, an interesting side of things that people often forget. It's not super useful, and obviously it sacrifices you having a helmet in your head slot, but it's still uh, it's still kind of something that doesn't necessarily occur to everybody once they get hold of those. Um, That'd be fun to mess around with server mates too. Putting on a creeper head, changing your skin, and just kind of, especially if you've <laughs> oh, got yes. the proximity chat on, just walk up behind a player and go. Hiss. Yeah, no, I've, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've definitely seen some folks do that. I think Good Times with Scar has been doing that on Hermitcraft recently, and oh yeah, you know, wiring a soundboard up to whatever microphone setup he has so oh, that he can nice. play sound effects into the game and just mess with people. It's. I uh, think it would be almost good. funnier to do your best zombie impression. So like, people would obviously know that it's you to yeah. a point. Like after the initial jump scare of the vision of the zombie coming right up behind you then they hear some like one of your friends go uh yeah <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. be pretty funny absolutely uh the other thing i've done this week uh that's kind of a, a meta thing outside of my server activity is uh migrated my mojang account so oh, i'm nice. i'm now officially migrated over to the microsoft account system enabled two-factor authentication right away it works like as far as i can tell i know some people have had various issues and hopefully once again we'll try and link the faq article you can find that at help.minecraft.net as well if you are curious and you're having issues with this process but as long as you remember that if you're using the vanilla launcher, you just have to add a Microsoft account to the launcher and, and not try and log in with your old Mojang account, 
works perfectly well for me. Um, Multi-MC is the launcher I tend to use when I'm launching modded instances, stuff like the replay mod, just anything that has a fabric and a couple of light mods on it is tend to, tends to be what I use. Um, I think that has now just started to add in the early stages of uh, Microsoft account authentication as well. So I haven't tried that, but then I was able to move the modded instance that I use for the simple voice chat mod and replay mod for Empires over to the vanilla launcher. And I think it's something that people forget often is that the vanilla launcher can launch modded clients and stuff as well. Like that's what a lot of the mod loaders out there can do. There's just alternatives out there for basically everything because people like the experience to be customizable. So uh, yeah, once again, for anybody who is at all concerned about the process of mig migrating your account, the one holdout that I've seen people mention is that you cannot have multiple Mojang accounts tied to the same Microsoft account. So you, if you have multiple accounts, you do need to have multiple different Microsoft accounts as well. You can't tie multiple Minecraft usernames to the same Microsoft account. But aside from that minor account management issue, I think it's it's a fine experience. Like I don't, I've not noticed any issues. Uh, it doesn't ask me to authenticate myself every time I log in. It's as smooth as it was before. Uh, I migrated a week and a half ago and forgot to mention it on the oh. show. It was so smooth. <laughs> yeah. Like I just, yeah. I mean, it came up and said, oh, we're going to migrate you. All right, I'll do that now before I start the stream. That's fine. Uh, and uh, I, again, I found it was a little bit odd at first because it threw up a Microsoft login window, but I've seen that before. Like you know, I, the last time I logged into Skype ages ago or like whatever it yeah. was that I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe when I was setting up the new PC, logging into new services, etc. Uh, but I find that the Windows experience as it stands right now, like once you're logged in, you're logged in. It all felt very familiar. Um, my, I have the advantage of having recently, you know, set up uh, and refreshed my password on my Microsoft account because I bought an Xbox in March. Yeah. So uh, I'm always logged in on that. And I kept it handy because when I first started adding apps like, you know, Netflix and Disney and all that kind of stuff, you had to make sure that you're logged into both Microsoft and you know, then you had to remember all your passwords for your different services. So I had that all written down. And I, I also use a password manager, uh, which is great because it's it's not platform exclusive. So I can use it on both my Mac and my PC. Uh, the only thing I can't use it on is my phone because that requires me to pay for it. But I, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. I can copy and paste, you know, when I need to. Um, but the experience of logging in, uh, linking to an existing account. It was just like, which account do you want to link to? It was like the only one I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once that was over, when I went back to the vanilla launcher, I was logged out and it just said log in. But the only thing that I think was a little bit problematic is that it didn't default show me the Windows login. It default showed me the My Mojang login. Right. Yeah. So I had to click log in with a Windows account like read carefully and just like log in with a windows account because that's just what i did yeah uh and then once i logged in everything was fine skin came over everything looked exactly the same with the exception that underneath my name it was microsoft as opposed to mojo yeah. on and your, the launcher your your like local saves are all in the same place all of your server yeah. information oh, is still there like it, it's yeah it's the, it doesn't it, change anything it launches the same thing from the same folder yeah. it makes sense um yeah and and i already had the microsoft account logged in from having to launch minecraft dungeons through that as well because i i bought the version oh. of the minecraft dungeons from the website rather than through the, the you know the release that's now that's, going to steam or that's or the, what i did yeah yep. so so that works out pretty well in the end um yep i had that i i just that's exactly what it was it was the fact that i bought i bought minecraft dungeons because i had minecraft dungeons is on the vanilla launcher but it doesn't launch from there it just launches a separate it launches like the microsoft store or something i can't mm -hmm. remember how it works on my pc but it, it doesn't launch the same way that java minecraft does it launches differently uh and uh that's what it was on the computer that i recently updated my microsoft account for um question for you about the you said it was the mc launcher what was it called a uh, multi mc yeah the a multi mc launcher so i've been playing fabric for ages we've been using that on the citadel for technical purposes for a long time and i launched fabric from the vanilla launcher mm -hmm. uh I the only time I've ever played something that wasn't from the vanilla launcher, I used the Twitch launcher, I think, for all of Fabric Three for my modded playthrough because yep. that was, I guess, for my for my green modded experience, it was the easiest way to keep the mod up to date and and log in. I did not enjoy the experience. I found that the Twitch launcher was incredibly complicated and convoluted. Mm -hmm. it created an entirely different 
not only install, but like install location was very different and everything was all over the place. Uh, still not entirely sure if I've uninstalled that, by the way. Um, with the multi-MC, what are the advantages to running that for your mods that you run, like your your uh, camera uh, mods and like replay mods and stuff like that? Like what's the advantage there compared to the vanilla? It makes managing individual instances kind of easier. There's a little bit more customization that is exposed to you through a GUI instead of you having to dive into folders and stuff in the vanilla launcher. Because, for example, you want to open a modded instance in the vanilla launcher, you can select it in the launcher itself, but from there you have to go out to the instance folder and drop a bunch of mods into a folder. Whereas MultiMC effectively creates a whole new .minecraft folder for each individual instance that you create, so there's less getting confused between all of the different versions of the game that you have installed. Everything gets saved to different directories, so you don't end up opening one save in a different version and getting confused between those. I think a lot of that is sort of features that the vanilla launcher didn't really have and have been more recently introduced, like notifying you when you're opening a world save in an older version and saying hey you probably shouldn't do this or make sure you back up before you do and so right. forth so i think a lot of that stuff is just vestigial uh but i think it's it's a lot easier to manage mods mod loaders you can install fabric one click through the multi mc instance creator and then you can just go and drag and drop mods into the instance from there without having to worry about opening up your Windows file system and churning through all of that. So it just makes things a little bit more user-friendly than the vanilla launcher does. Ultimately, it does the same thing, um, but okay. you can you know create and retire instances very easily through there without having to kind of dive into what looks like the back end of your launcher in order to mess with some stuff. Uh, other people who use modded Minecraft more frequently will probably have a little bit more insight into this than I do, but for what I do, it's just... You know, it's nice to have a couple of uh, slightly more user-friendly options when it comes to just updating stuff like Replay Mod, for example, just dragging and dropping it in instead of having to dig through my file system to find my mods folder. Right. Okay. Because I'm I'm looking at doing a modded playthrough. I was going to try to stick with 117, but the biome generation stuff I wanted to explore is really only updated for 116.5. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I wanted to do was take some of the mods that are not in all of Fabric 3 for 116.5 and drop them in that might have some advantages and just kind of make it feel a little bit more like 117. Uh, and uh, having a mod loader that'll make that easier rather than, like, as you said, diving into the file system, making sure you get the right window open and all that kind of stuff would be nice because I do run a version of Fabric for my regular, you know, giant air quotes, vanilla, you know, Citadel gameplay. So I don't want to confuse the two and and cause a, a problem so i will more than likely look into the multi mc launcher mm -hmm. definitely definitely worth it i think if you if you expect to have multiple instances of minecraft and different versions that you're handling it's it's all just there on the surface for you without you having to dig too much deeper Moving on into the news this week, Java Edition 1.18 Experimental Snapshot 7 is out. You can find that at minecraft.net. We'll have a link in our show notes this week. This is probably going to be the last Experimental Snapshot for now. We are focusing on getting these tweaks into the normal Java Snapshot and Bedrock Beta series. That's a quote from the post. Changes in Experimental Snapshot 7 compared to 6. Noodle caves can generate at any height, no longer capped at Y level 130. This means you'll sometimes find tiny cave openings and cracks in mountain peaks. Tread with care. Some parts of the terrain are ever so slightly smoother. In tech speak, there is less 3D noise. Elytra doesn't take durability damage when gliding, only when using rockets. So mending or unbreaking enchantments are not necessarily quote unquote must haves on your elytra, especially now that there are higher mountains and cliffs to launch from. The Elytra rocket boost is a bit weaker, so you cannot fly as fast with rockets as you used to. We are testing this for several reasons. Elytra rocket boosting is so fast that other means of transport become almost redundant. We want to balance that out a bit. Most servers get laggy when players fly around with Elytra and rockets because they fly faster than chunks can load. With the new world height coming in 118, this lag would most likely get worse. There is so much more cool terrain out there to enjoy now, so why not slow down a little? Note that Elytra gliding speed is unchanged. This change affects only rocket boosting. 
So I think the elytra changes are really the highlight here. Um, we're going to give our overall thoughts about the experimental snapshot series as a whole in the main discussion this week, because as the blog post said, this is probably going to be the last experimental snapshot before some of these changes and tweaks and the whole new terrain system is integrated into the main series of snapshots. But the elytra changes, I've had a bit of time to play around with them this week, are quite interesting. Uh, so a little bit more detail that isn't quite, you know fleshed out to this degree in the blog post, is that all rockets now decrease elytra durability by a flat rate of three when they are used to boost. So as soon as you right click with the rocket, that is three durability off your elytra. And that's regardless of flight duration as well. I tried this with all three different types of fireworks that we can craft. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, if you've just been making flight duration one rockets, add a couple more gunpowder to the recipe in the crafting table and it will give you a longer flight duration which means you get a longer boost um and that is still gonna only affect your elytra durability by three so for long distance flight potentially gives you more reason to craft those rockets um in the experimental snapshot 7 build using a riptide does not affect elytra durability uh, although it does affect trident durability and that means it's still possible to travel as fast as before by gliding or by using Riptide in the rain, which is still, I believe, much faster than boosting with fireworks was. So I'm not certain if they're going to keep that relationship intact or if Riptide is maybe going to, uh, you know, ex extract a bit of durability from your Elytra as well. But I think a lot of that is down to the fact that players don't, tend to use Riptide in the rain all that much because if you play like I do you sleep a lot and that avoids phantom spawning but that also resets the weather cycle so you don't get quite as much rain. Um, so let's start off by talking about how do you how do you currently fly with Elytra Joel? Do you tend to use a lot of fireworks to you know get speed or like change direction as you fly or are you a bit more conservative with your uh, rocket usage? After thinking about this for a little bit before the, the show, I realized that I've been walking around a lot more because of all the work that I'm putting into the area. Sure, I'm not yeah. flying over it as quickly. So I tend to be walk. Any excuse I have to walk and talk with the chat, I generally, even if it's a long path, I just generally walk it because it's pretty. Uh, I do, however, get fed up, fed up with walking back and forth over the same street to go get materials. Like I forgot this in the shulker box. So I got to go back to this to get that. Uh, flying back and forth to AFK locations when I take stream breaks. And so uh, I tend to do these little hops. So one stage one rocket is more than enough for what I need to hop across the river. I very often have to do the whole spin, slow down, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't, don't smack your face against the wall sort of thing. Um, the other time I use rockets is to get up somewhere high, uh, usually on the peak of one of my towers, to then look down at what I've been doing, kind of yeah. give people an overview or decide to spin around and just kind of like get a feel for how the town has come together as a whole by flying over it, which I think a lot of people do um, for looking at their builds from a distance. Because one of the things I find difficult is to quickly back up and assess something and then come back in and build on it. You know, like sometimes you have to take that step back. Um, so for me, I, I don't spam rockets to travel. We have a pretty robust network uh, in the nether. Um, I've always just kind of and this could have just be my personality. I just tend to hit the rocket and then wait till I start to feel I'm slowing down a little bit and then use another one. I don't just constantly click in a rhythm because I know that until I slow down, there's no point. Like I don't really feel like I get there that much faster. It's akin to the people that run around in Minecraft that jump constantly because it apparently gets you there faster. To mm -hmm. me, it just makes my eye twitch. So uh, I tend to just, um, we have a long desert tunnel in the nether and I'll fly down it, but it's just like, I'll hit one rocket, wait for myself to like nearly hit the ground and then I'll just hit another rocket mm -hmm. and just keep yep. on going that way. Um, I find the rocket noise a little grating. So that be, might be another reason why I don't do it all the time. Uh, and I don't have a lot of reason to travel thousands of blocks in the overworld by flying over stuff. Uh, it, it, we have enough nether tunnels that I'll use those. Uh, or again, it's just not that far that it matters to use multiple rockets to try to save, you know, yourself some time. Um, I, I really don't see myself being affected too much by this change. I'm sure I'll notice it, but I'm sure I'll adapt to it immediately. Uh, and it might be something where because I've not used higher uh, durability rockets uh, for a long time, I really only use stage one rockets. Um, 
I might not really notice the difference. And by switching to a stage three for those longer flights, when I eventually have to take them, I, I might be just like, this is fine. You know, I really, it really won't matter. Um, I'm curious to see how it's going to play out when players are able to land on, maybe take that bed out of their inventory, sleep on the side of a mountain, and then without really much effort, jump off and keep going for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, I think the new terrain is is probably the key factor in this not affecting players too much in the future to the, not to the point where I think it's going to be too disruptive. I think that it's just, it's going to just take a little bit of time in the new terrain for people to go, okay, well, this is, this is a change, but it's easily adaptable. Uh, I think maybe long-term players, people in forever worlds that have a lot of low lying area, like I do on the Citadel are probably going to notice a little bit more, but again, like, I don't think it's really going to matter to me that much. Um, one thing that I thought of immediately uh, is how often my one rocket is too much for what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I imagine that one of the reasons for this change that they didn't mention in the notes uh, is to prevent players from painting the walls of caves with their face. Yeah, uh, yeah. Absolutely. As you're in these giant caves and you want to fly around, it would really suck to be in this cool cave, taking a, a rocket and then just die as you explode in a yard sale up against the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that avoiding that would be would be ideal. Yeah, definitely. And I I find that having played around with this a little bit in Snapshot 7, it's it's noticeable if you use Elytra more frequently. You can tell that you are moving slower. And I happen to be close to a couple of those larger cave entrances, and navigating through those like noodle caves or, or like the kind of wider uh kind of spaghetti caves as you're flying around with this slower rocket boosting is really quite fun and it measures out the pace of movement a little bit more and these are the kind of caves that now they are widened out you really can fly into without much modification by players players would make elytra courses flying through terrain but they'd have to do a lot of digging and widening out of some of this stuff whereas now you're right if you wanted to fly around a cavern in one of those massive underground cave systems you could potentially do that now as long as you knew which way you were going without running into walls as frequently and the pace feels a bit more measured so i do think it kind of adapts elytra for the underground experience a little better which is an unforeseen consequence of this um but yeah i i like you i don't tend to spam rockets everywhere a lot of my flight just happens to be just you know, back and forth to opposite sides of my base if I need to get something out of my storage system, but I'm working on the river and that kind of stuff. And I, I find that a single duration one rocket gets me there very easily, even, yeah, using Riptide more frequently now. Just a single Riptide launch and then gliding down is is great. But I like the emphasis on using the Elytra to glide, and the fact that it doesn't take durability anymore is huge because... It allows for conservation of resources because if you're just using the rocket to get some height and then leaving it, you can travel a lot further as long as you can be maybe a little bit more patient about it. Um, it increases players' opportunities to use Elytra in their native environment as well. Going to the end and end cities, the first thing you want to do is put on your Elytra, glide down from there and either look for more end cities or look for a way out. And... A lot of people are hesitant to put on the Elytra because right now the way Elytra durability works is it loses one point of durability per second of flight, which ultimately I think only gives you about seven minutes worth of flight time, which sounds like a lot, but if you're exploring the end dimension and there is no way to get home except to find one of those bedrock gateways again, it can be a pretty tough experience, not to mention you know, needing to gain height, you haven't brought fireworks with you that you can just fly around freely. You tend to find people getting paranoid about their elytra breaking and then having to spend longer in the end. You also see people bringing mending and unbreaking books and an anvil with them to the end just so they can make sure their elytra is maximized in terms of its overall flight potential. Whereas now, you get to the top of an end city ship you put your elytra on, you glide down. That hasn't taken any of the durability. If you're not using firework rockets at all, the thing never has a chance to break, which I think is a really significant change. It allows people to not have that immediate worry of durability loss as soon as they get probably one of the most important items in the game for most players in terms of, you know, transportation and getting around. 
I think as an end game player too, with the XP changes that they made in 116, because I have mending on my Elytra, I don't have to really worry about it. I'm probably still going to have unbreaking and mending on it anyway. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I am definitely less worried about the Elytra now than I ever have been because the one thing that could still happen to me was it breaking mid flight yeah. and, mm -hmm. and you falling out of the air. So as long as the rocket didn't remove the, the durability, you're not going to just drop like a stone. Cause like I'll fly in the nether, but there's always something in the back of my mind where it's like, I'd rather fly over a path, <laughs> you know, like than a large lava lake. And uh, I don't spend a lot of time in the, in the end, in the void, but uh, doing that, you know, end city shulker hunt, like the, the electric durability was always a, a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like to me a good change overall. I, I, um, I imagine that there's just some extreme cases where people are traveling thousands of blocks in the end that they might wish that they could do that a little bit faster. But I just, it's, I think those are going to be the loud minority. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, there, there are fringe cases of that, but ultimately it's about finding new ways to use your rockets. Like they said, the gliding speed has not been affected. It's not been capped at all. So say you use a couple of rockets to get up into the air and then you find a gliding angle that allows you to accelerate. If you use a rocket, once you get past a certain speed, you're actually slowing yourself down, <laughs> which means that, you know, you can find a decent gliding angle and if you get enough height then you can glide at a decent speed, the the equivalent of the speeds that you'd get when you were boosting with rockets, and you'd probably get there in the same amount of time. It just requires a little bit more nuance and perhaps even a little bit more skill than just constantly right-clicking your way until you found something good. Um, I was doing a bit of testing before this, and uh, Elytra having 432 durability, I looked that up on the Minecraft wiki, but um, that means effectively that with each rocket taking three durability, they will break after the player uses 144 rockets. Presuming you don't have unbreaking or mending on the Elytra at this point. So if you only bring 143 rockets with you on a trip and your Elytra is fully repaired, you can guarantee that you're not going to drop out of the sky at any point whatsoever, which is an enormous, like, you know, it's helpful in terms of your security. Like, it helps you feel a lot safer using it. Um, according to the Minecraft wiki right now, 432 durability, considering that it decreases at one second per one durability, gets you about 7 minutes and 12 seconds of gliding time, which is approximately the time it can take you to travel about 10,000 blocks. So I tested this in Snapshot 7. I got 143 flight duration 3 rockets, used all of them like relatively regularly like i wasn't spamming them i was just kind of boosting them in a, in a sort of fairly measured way probably double clicked a couple of times more than i would have liked to but i used that at a sort of diagonal trajectory to get up to about 9500 blocks on the y-axis so i was really really high up i found a stable downward glide trajectory again probably not optimal because i don't know all of the the kind of maths behind what the optimal gliding angle is in terms of acceleration and the lack of height that you lose. And I left it for about 45 minutes, <laughs> which is, like, mathematically speaking, yeah, about five times more than the maximum travel time on an unenchanted elytra. I was still gliding. I would estimate that I was going to get over an hour of travel time out of getting that amount of height, and I was in the 60,000, 70,000 range of blocks traveled. So I, I'd estimate that one, when, I, when I landed, I would probably have landed about 100,000 blocks away compared to the 10,000 that you could get from Elytra now. So mathematically speaking, if you are using these optimally by just getting height and gliding and you know which direction you're going, you can travel way further and in complete safety. You're not going to fall out of the sky at any point and then lose your items tens of thousands of blocks away from home. It's a really interesting change, and I honestly don't think there are that many drawbacks beyond just people being impatient to get somewhere, which, you know, again, this is Minecraft, time is almost a currency to some people, but I do think if people are looking to glide, at, like, you can glide almost indefinitely as long as you have enough height, I think that's a really interesting change.
Yeah, I mean, I the impatience is is definitely something that I I don't I'm not an impatient person, but when I'm trying to finish a build on a stream, like I can definitely see you know me using rockets more and more to travel over a a, a river that I have bridged, <laughs> like I can walk mm -hmm. across it no problem. Um, what I could and maybe should do is install a beacon in the area with a with a speed boost on it to make maybe make that flight happen less often. But it's um. It's one of those things that I think you're right. I think the impatience of players trying to get over a short distance is more than likely what's going to be the the thing. Because like you said, mathematically speaking, over long distances, this is more efficient. Um, I use Elytra as a means to be able to sip my coffee while I'm traveling. Yeah. Because if, mm -hmm. if I'm walking or running or doing anything on the ground, one, I have to look out for creepers. And two, I, I can't move if I take one hand off of the mouse or the keyboard. Like I need one to steer and one to move forward. Uh, unless I'm going in a straight line, I can't sip my coffee. <laughs> yeah. So the Elytra provides an opportunity for me to like hands off uh, the steering wheel and just kind of enjoy, you know, maybe a chocolate chip cookie and a, and a sip of coffee. So, um, I mean, I, I'll be interested to see how it all pans out. I'm I'm sure it's going to be fine. Uh, I I feel like one of the things they could do to better balance transport in the game is to not necessarily just nerf Elytra, but maybe maybe buff a few other things like minecarts and, and yeah. other methods that, that right? was going to be my next point was one of the things they've s suggested is a a reason for this is to balance out other means of transport and my hope is that that's something they're looking at revisiting in an upcoming update whether 1.19 or later we did mention last week when we were talking about potential updates for 1.19 they have considered overhauling the minecart system in the past and maybe that means there is more potential for that to become a thing to balance that out you know to bring those up in line with things like elytra the problem with minecarts of course being that you have to lay down the rails somehow beforehand <laughs> and and so that's kind of like you know you've gone back and forth a couple of times at that point it's a more established route that you need to take there there's there's advantages to a lot of different things right now but it'll be interesting to see where elytra fits into all of this and as far as i can tell the change hasn't been particularly poorly received in the same way as say like some of the changes to mob spawning were so i think this has potential to be included in 1.18 when it arrives as long as there aren't any substantial arguments to to the contrary here i think the main thing pe players are looking for is you know are other forms of transport going to be made better in an adjustment for elytra being made worse hypothetically um, yeah I mean, as someone that has been spending a lot of time playing in Satisfactory where they have what's called hyper tubes, which you just like a minecart track, you have to lay them down first. But uh, not only are they time saving once you have actually established them, they're really fun. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that if they if they combine a way to uh, buff existing modes of travel, not just by making them more efficient or faster, but also adding that fun Minecraft spin to them, then you're going to be having people that are just going to like, I don't want to use Elytra because this is just more fun. You know, yeah. uh, whether it's a copper tube that I, you know, made a joke about on the show before, or if it's rocket minecarts, I'm on board for both. Uh, and let the hilarity ensue, especially if you've got a creeper and a rocker, mi rocket minecart. Like I just, <laughs> the possibilities are endless, but like it just, you know, if you add some fun to it, then I think that you'll have uh, a better balanced response from the community. Definitely. Let's uh, let's lis listen to the voice of the community here because we've got some chunk mail to read on this week's show. Uh, as usual, if you'd like to email the show, the email address now and always will be spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Uh, the first episode comes in from Shunosaurus, and they are a landscape artist member of our Discord. Thank you so much for the email. The subject this week is calcite and Minecraft geology. Hey, Pix and Joel, I've been building with a fair deal of andesite recently, and I learned that the three decorative stone types, granite, diorite, and andesite, all have crafting recipes that involve combining different proportions of cobblestone and quartz. This reminded me of real-world igneous rock formation. Diorite in the real world is formed with a high silica content, reflected by the use of quartz in the crafting recipe. Andesite has a lesser silica percentage, so diluting the diorite with cobblestone creates this more felsic material. In turn, granite has a greater silica percentage, so it is formed by increasing the silica content of the rock. Igneous geology lesson aside, these crafting recipes got me thinking about one of the newest decorative stone types in the game, calcite. 
Unlike the three stone types just mentioned, calcite is not an igneous rock and therefore doesn't have the silica content of the other rocks mentioned. Calcite is formed by calcium carbonate, made from the shells of marine organisms like corals or plankton. This got me thinking, what if calcite could be crafted in a similar vein to the three decorative stone types? I was thinking a combination of maybe cobblestone and bone meal to represent the calcium carbonate. This leads to my question for y'all, what other blocks would you like to have a crafting recipe? Are there any blocks in the game that you think should stay uncraftable and non-renewable to encourage exploration and quarrying? Sorry for the long-winded geology lesson, I just think that a tiny aspect of Minecraft's education goes underappreciated. Thank you both for the wonderful content, it's been a regular part of my weekly routine for over a year now. Shanosaurus fell into lava and became an igneous rock. <laughs> alas, alas for the dinosaurs. Um, so there are two parts to this email, really. The first being uh, talking about the calcite crafting recipe. And it's really interesting that the Mojang team has clearly put a lot of thought into the components that make up the decorative stone types, the igneous rocks. And and that's, uh, that's a really fun uh, point there. I think we've talked about a calcite crafting recipe in previous weeks. Has anything new occurred to you about that, Joel, or are we are we sticking to our guns on this one? I I mean, like I feel like a lot of blocks that are hard to get in Minecraft should have an alternative recipe. I'm not saying that it has to be an easy one. Uh, for example, knowing a little bit more. Thank you for the educational email about calcite. What about using coral blocks? or nautilus shells uh, to create calcite. Bone meal to me seems like a little bit too much of an easy get. Like I've got more bone meal than I know what to do with. So I feel like uh, having a, a slightly more challenging uh, way to get calcite would make it um, a little bit more accessible. I understand that Mojang is putting calcite into the world gen in the mountains. There's more than ways to get it than just geodes now, or there will be when 118 comes. But I feel like, uh, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, Time is a currency for some players. Mm -hmm. And if you're a busy adult, you've got a family, you love playing Minecraft, but you only get a couple hours a weekend. And if you want to build a calcite city, you're in for a heck of a grind, you know, <laughs> even with the, the changes coming in 118. And so I feel like if you want to put in the time, much like laying down a Minecraft track or Minecart track, excuse me, then being able to craft calcite out of crazy drops that you got from your epic you know, Nautilus farm or whatever it is that you want to do. Or if you decide, I don't really care about this chunk of ocean with this giant uh, coral reef in it. I would much rather just mine it all out and turn it into calcite because that suits my purposes better. I think giving player options is is just a better way to go. Um, having one way to get something and have it be only one way to mine it. I think while there is a place for it, for example, obsidian, uh, I don't think that having really highly desired blocks be gated by just really tough to get real world generation is a best solution for all players. Like I feel like by having alternatives, then the players that want a lot of it will just come up with their redstone farm or they'll come up with a most efficient way to get it rather than just like blitzing an entire area and mining it out and hoping you get enough, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I've maintained that as soon as Calcite gets any alternate crafting variants, like stairs and slabs and stuff, it's going to need a crafting recipe for the block or a, a trade mm -hmm. from villagers for the block. Because yes. otherwise, yeah, you're going to end up with a lot of people getting very mad that they can't have all of the Calcite stairs they wanted and that the recipe still only gives them four if they make it in a crafting table. Um I personally stick to my idea that a calcite crafting recipe would be better if it required amethyst shards to craft. And I say that knowing mm -hmm. full well that farming a geode is tedious. Um, but I think it's important that acquiring larger amounts of a material is sort of gated behind access to that material in the first place, which is now possible through these veins of calcite that spawn in mountains. But I do think finding a geode and finding calcite that way seems more likely because you can do that virtually anywhere as long as you go underground and find a geode. So my my intent has always been, you know, to imagine the player getting amethyst shards from a geode to craft the blocks that they find around a geode. And 
you know, if you want tinted glass and renewable amethyst blocks as well, you might have a fairly limited amount of amethyst shards to work with. But yeah, I definitely prefer the idea of needing to find the resources in the real world before you can just reproduce them anywhere, whether it be at your base or somewhere else. So I think the cobblestone and bone meal crafting recipe, while it might be geologically accurate, seems a little bit too easy for a block that is currently so desirable and such an iconic feeling block when you find it in the situations that you find it like it really adds to the layers of a geode that you find the amethyst buried inside of those layers of of white and black material and so i think it's it's really nice to have that be a standout feature rather than going oh calcite you know the thing that i've been crafting since i killed a skeleton and dug up some stone (laughs) yeah i think i think it needs to be a little bit more more hard to reach than that um, moving on to the second half of this email, though, other blocks in the game that we think should stay uncraftable and non-renewable to encourage exploration, or other blocks that we need to have a crafting recipe. And I don't know necessarily about crafting recipes. I think the main thing that I would like to have craftable is probably something like red sand, just because it's so hard to get red sandstone, whereas sand from a desert is abundant relatively speaking mesa biomes you know uh, badlands biomes where they have a decent amount of red sand a are not that easy to find b only come with a top layer of red sand and c the red sand doesn't then give way to a bunch of red sandstone it's all orange terracotta underneath there so red sandstone so rarely occurs naturally that you're not going to really find it any other way and so being able to acquire red sand in larger quantities so we could even consider building with red sandstone seems to me uh, a no-brainer how about you joel i like the idea of being able to craft stuff like sand um especially if it adds a different gameplay mechanic like grinding other stones down into smaller particles yes uh crafting red sand you know by using dye or combining other things like maybe if you grind terracotta and sand together you get red sand you know like just something you still have to harvest blocks from somewhere in order to craft something else like i don't necessarily and one of the reasons why i left this option out of my notes for this response to this email was i don't think a villager trade is while it's renewable technically i i'm not a big fan of that i find that most villager trading is op right now so Mm -hmm. um i much rather have i feel more satisfied if i have to then set up a way to like get a cobblestone generator full you know take the cobblestone from that generator and funnel it into a grinder which doesn't exist on minecraft i know but like i've seen stuff like that in modded where you yeah can mod- grind modded stuff minecraft down. gives us like crushes yeah. and stuff like that all the yeah. time you can turn cobblestone into gravel you turn gravel into sand and so forth yeah yeah exactly i mean it and it, again requires a time investment to one get the resources to do the thing figure out how to how to do it what the ratios you need like i like that kind of gameplay and then i feel like almost more accomplished in that I am no longer just going out into the world and picking this stuff up, which is time consuming. I have increased my knowledge and my efficient, you know, ability to the point where I'm making this stuff on my own, which required probably just as much time, you know, to then go out and collect it. But at least now it's moving forward. I've, I've, I have a system to do that. So that sand and, and red sand were at the top of my list as well. The other thing that I've surprisingly found a lot of use for and get really cheesed off when i run out of it is tough mm-hmm. and uh i know that tough as described in the minecraft wiki is uh lava that's cooled into uh, a different form um so it feels kind of like an obsidian situation where you're only going to find it in certain places near deep slate um but i feel like an option to craft it in the same way that you can use it's lava blue ice and soul sand to create basalt right yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so if if tough was something where you could create it in that kind of a way uh maybe not as fast but like if there was some other kind of way to create tough with uh in the same way that you can do cobblestone and sandstone or not sandstone cobblestone and stone generation um then i think that that could, could be interesting uh maybe it's more of a smelting situation uh we have the ability now where blocks can go into water um we don't have i correct me if i'm wrong but there's no mechanic in the game where if you toss an item so not not into 
uh, a cauldron, but like if you put something into water, it doesn't necessarily change it. You have to place a block like concrete powder for it to then be changed by water. Um, obviously, that's how you make obsidian with lava and water uh, or cobblestone. Um, no. Yeah. Is it obsidian? Obsidian is with lava source and yeah. water, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like having some sort of mechanic that is consistent with other mechanics in the game for something like tough is something that I think would be be interesting again i don't think you're going to be able to make a lot of it like you don't see obsidian generators like it's it's a harder block to make you can make it but it's not like you're going to be making stacks of it in a couple of minutes right and i and i feel like tough could have the same sort of thing where if you want some you're going to have to figure a way to get it you know on mass and invest some time uh in the same way that we've got now you know dripstone that has allowed players to have renewable lava it's not fast but it's renewable lava mm-hmm yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I I think further down the line we could see them introducing stuff like this. It's it's worth remembering as well that the materials are all relatively new. Um so I think in terms of calcite there could be a way of getting that in future. I would like to see some other way of getting deep slate because mining a lot of it is a bit of a pain <laughs> right now, but then that's what people start making, you know, things like tunnel bores and more exciting kind of ways of of mining for the stuff so that you don't have to worry as much about the time spent mining it all out manually and there's potential for these mechanics to expand in future so it's an interesting discussion to bring up right now moving on to our next email from jay pumpelitz a frequent listener of the show the end and the deep dark johnny and joel keeping it brief as per your request I feel spoiled with 118 already, so I feel greedy even thinking ahead. But if I had to make a choice between an update to the end or a select biome or two, I feel the end would make more sense considering how all the overworld biomes are going to look new with the terrain gen updates. Anyway, I had an idea for the end too. I thought I'd run it by you. Skulk sensors have an end look to, the, to them, right? I swear one of you said this at some point. What about finding the odd patch of skulk blocks which act as a one-way portal back to the overworld and straight into a deep dark biome? If the end and the deep dark are somehow connected, which their textures suggest, this would give some sort of lore as to how the warden came to be in the overworld in the first place. That's if there's even lore required. Maybe it doesn't need the backstory. It gives a new reason to go to the end and an easier way to locate deep dark biomes through exploring the end and some decision making element to the player, i.e. do I traverse back to the central island to get home or go through this skulk puddle on the floor and risk getting past the warden. I'm not saying the deep dark can't be accessed through the overworld, but just a, suggest a suggestion for another route. Thanks for the podcast. Absolutely loving it. Jay Pumpelets got poked in the arm from an unsafe distance boo <laughs> safe distances only um hopefully from within your bubble i like the creativity that has gone into this email a lot um mm -hmm. i i think obviously the skulk is something that people are thinking about a lot right now especially with king b dogs mentioning it a couple of times on twitter i believe people have even dug into files at this point and found a block that had a texture in the game that has been removed in kind of the same way that like people were speculating about bees having wax and that i think eventually led to the ideas that formulated around candles um but there are a lot of people thinking about what the skulk is what it does just right for speculation because we know virtually nothing at this stage and you are right in that we have both mentioned in the past that it looked fairly similar to material from the end whether that texture was temporary or whether it was you know just a, a vibe that they were running with even if it's not linked to the end it's the art team's way of portraying the skulk and the warden as being otherworldly um but i do kind of like the idea that the skulk is somehow the key to the end in in some way or another and i think honestly i'd be much happier if it was a two-way portal <laughs> between the end and the deep dark but if it was only able to be activated from the end side so you could avoid players skipping the whole progression of getting eyes of ender going to the nether finding the stronghold all of that kind of stuff um because right now we already have those bedrock end gateways i was mentioning earlier to take us back to the central island and from there to the overworld but the relative difficulty 
with the end is in returning to those far-flung areas. If you need to go back to the end to retrieve your items after you die to an enderman on a remote island somewhere, it's a nightmare. And while obviously that's part of the difficulty of the game and of traversing that dimension in the first place, you don't see people building bases in the end much either, and it's because it takes so long to get back there. If you build anything significant in the end, it's usually fairly close to the main island because those are the areas that you can portal to through those gateways once you've fought the dragon a few times. And I think if we get an update to the end eventually, you're going to want to get people building out there. And so a lot of the time, you're going to find yourself struggling with the reality of having to travel all of those blocks again in order to just get back to the the area that you are basing at the time. Um, and I've, I've tried a couple of different end bases in the past, and I often found it way more convenient to just bring everything that I could to generate resources and then stay out there for as long as possible because going back there after returning to the overworld was such a pain. And so I like the idea of there being a shortcut. I don't know if I would be happy with it just being one way because we already have quick ways to return to the overworld. That said, having it you know, spit you out in the deep dark adds another interesting level of challenge because having survived the harsh environment of the end you're suddenly in the middle of a completely different experience you turn up in the deep dark the warden is right there you need to be quiet you need to sneak around distract it all of that stuff suddenly factors in in a way that you know you're you're avoiding looking at something when you're in the end and then you immediately go to avoiding triggering something's sense of hearing um, so that there's two very different mechanics going on there, but they seem linked in a way as well. I liked the idea of of the the consequence. It's like you can travel all the way back to the central island, depending on how far you are from an end gateway, or you can go through this portal and the price is that it's not going to necessarily be a safe trip. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've got your fresh elytra, you've got all the goodies that you have, the shulker boxes that you want to keep. And so you're going to take a risk when you know the dragon is done, you know, you can go back or you can you can jump through the portal. Um, I think one of the things that might be appealing too is if if you've gone and had some really bad luck and you don't have an elytra and you're stuck walking back to your end gateway, um, then this actually might be appealing depending on how skilled you are at the game and whether or not you know anything about the warden. Um, if this was a ca the case, then I really hope that Mojang takes a note of the word skulk puddle. Like that has <laughs> to be a thing. Like I just like the idea of skulk sensors surrounding some sort of weird looking puddle like liquid material that you jump into and it sends you somewhere. I just I find that really, really interesting so much more than just jumping through a weird portal block. Um, I, I just it has like a Stargate vibe to it um, that I think is really interesting, um, even like a little bit of a Stranger Things vibe yeah uh, -huh. uh the the consequence for me that wasn't mentioned in the email is like sure you're in the deep dark but where like yeah. where is the deep dark located in the overworld how frequent are they are they are we talking like woodland mansion rare because how like sure you've made it you've successfully you know uh avoided the warden and you're now poking your head out uh on the surface hopefully you're not underneath a mountain uh and when you do get out where are you in relation to your base, your stuff, your spawn? Like, how far are we talking? Because it mm -hmm. could be another sacrifice. You might have a couple thousand blocks to walk home, um, which I know in the grand scheme of things is not the end of the world. But like, it could be you could be a lot farther. Uh, there could be an ocean between you and and where you need to go. Uh, I feel like there are some unforeseen consequences, which, again, I'm not saying are bad. I'm just saying, like, here are the things you have to consider before you jump through this puddle. Uh, and I think that's an interesting idea. And. As far as the two-way portal, on one hand, I guess, you know, if the warden is as tough or tougher than the dragon, then I don't really see an issue with the warden being the guardian of the end, right? Like, if you want to skip the central island and go straight to the shulker boxes and end cities, then go find a deep dark and surpass and defeat or avoid the warden and get into the end that way knowing that you have to come back the exact same way you came mm -hmm. uh or perhaps not maybe you have to beat the warden once to get in and then again to get out depending on which puddle you jump into and which deep dark biome because as far as i know the deep dark information we've received from king b dogs on twitter is that there's more than just one it's not like it's one biome i feel like it's something that happens frequently in an overworld yeah. well not frequently but more than once 
Um, so that I think is an interesting kind of way to, to look at it. Um, I do hope that some of the skulk blocks, uh, even the skulk sensors are at least added to the end, even if there's no functionality, like, you know, they suggested, um, in the email, I, I really just like the idea of adding some color and some stuff that looks like end material, even just purely visual. I just think it's, it's really cool. Um, I do like the idea of skulk blocks somehow helping players deal with Endermen too. Like maybe if Endermen, like they avoid water, just won't walk on skulk blocks. Mm -hmm. So like if you if you have enough blocks on you and you create like a little almost like when you when you see in in um, fantasy movies where they've like lay magical dust on the ground and to create like a perimeter where that that spirits won't cross like i feel like if you created a square you know, of skulk blocks and mm -hmm. the endermen just be just like they'd be mad at you but they're just i like, can't cross this line yeah. I, I think that could be really interesting and then leave that to technical players like what happens if the endermen can only go one way because there's skulk blocks everywhere and there's only one clear path for them i think there could be some really interesting game mechanics there too uh then they just teleport through it that's the problem <laughs> I, I suppose yeah I, I do that all the time with minecart rails right now because mobs don't like crossing those on account of it blocking players railway tracks and so mobs typically avoid stepping onto rails and so it's always really fun surrounding a creeper or something with minecart rail and just watching it not know what to do <laughs> they're just kind of <laughs> just kind of stuck there unless something causes them to step on the rail at which point they have no problem pathfinding from there but yeah it's always uh, it's always really funny trapping mobs that way um let's move into this week's main discussion though we're going to keep it relatively brief here because we don't have a huge amount to say on this but since we have now reached the end uh, according to the latest blog post anyway of the experimental snapshot series for 1.18 there will still be some more development snapshots before we get the full release of 1.18 so don't think it's just around the corner but I thought it'd be a good time to look at the experimental snapshots we've had, not necessarily in terms of, you know, the exact change logs, but in their overall intention. Uh, are they now a good place for Mojang to test ideas, and should they do this for future updates? What do we think was successful about them? Were they even really necessary if a lot of these changes are now being put into the game? And, and share a few more of our thoughts on, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of experimental snapshots as an approach. Uh, so we've we've thought a little bit about this. Um, before we get into our own opinions, I think the major differences that we can see between an experimental snapshot and our regular snapshots seem to be that A, there is no guarantee that the features being tested are going to arrive in a vanilla Minecraft update at all. This is all purely speculative things that might end up in the game, it's just stuff that they wanted to try out with a bit less pressure. Uh, B, there was no guarantee of compatibility with other worlds, whether forwards or backwards, so each uh, experimental snapshot could not be carried over into the next one for various reasons. And C, uh, an emphasis on deeper player feedback, uh, and this is more player input into the broader mechanics of Minecraft, more constructive conversations with the developers, and then play testing in the game modes that feel relevant to the experience. Instead of just loading things up in creative, plopping a few blocks down, this was much more, how does this feel to play in survival? And frequently the developers were calling for people to give their opinions, having tried out some survival gameplay. Uh, so I'll let you start, Joel. What do you think uh, of the experimental snapshots as an approach to developing bigger ideas like this within Minecraft? So I stopped playing the experimental snapshots as I started to have more um, gameplay and technical setbacks. So most of my thoughts on this come from doing a podcast about this stuff weekly um, and just the overall kind of like response that I've seen. I feel like the snapshots do a really good job of managing player expectations right? You know that what may or may not stick uh, is, is you know, it's not permanent. Like you can feel free to criticize because we may, we might not lock, like it ourselves. We may try this. You may not like it. We may not like it. We're going to change it. That I feel like that allows players to not um, get too defensive. Snapshots, proper snapshots have a, this is coming feel to them yeah and so if something is coming that players don't like i feel like there's a lot more of a defensive feedback whereas managing player expectations with experimental snapshots i feel they've been very clear from the get-go these are not permanent we are basically throwing spaghetti at the wall because these changes are so vast 
that we can't just make them in a, in a, in a closed room. We really need to try to widespread test this. And I think that that's a strength. Uh, cause I've seen, I've seen more constructive feedback or deep dives from more technical players to provide information to Mojang, um, than I have before. Um, I feel like that feedback is actually another point. Whereas, um, you're going to get, I feel like more feedback from players that are, um, more inclined to be technical. Like mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot more deep dives on, on performance and, um, ways that the game may not be played by the average player that has to be considered. Uh, so I feel like there's a, a, a better dialogue with the technical community around Minecraft, which is sizable. I'm not, not diminishing that at all. Um, I'm hoping that enough feedback and testing on, um, those kind of technical difficulties and performance issues is something that has been helpful for Mojang because I find, and this is anecdotal from my personal experience that every time Minecraft updates, I am met with a host of technical hurdles to just play the game. Uh, and I don't run a potato of a computer and I don't feel like Minecraft should require a beefy PC to, to play. Um, so I feel like, uh, these experimental snapshots are hopefully, uh, allowing a lot of information to flow towards Mojang for the, um, optimization, I guess, workflow. I'm not sure if that's yeah. the right mm -hmm. term for it in the future. I know we haven't seen that yet because they're still focusing on features, not optimization. Um, but I feel like it's a nice window into what the process is at Mojang, what they consider, uh, the big red flag that they wave and say, Hey, by the way, not optimized. So if you're experiencing a lot of lag, yep, we are too. Like we, we see it. We, we, it's, it's not something that's worth addressing now, but it is something we're aware of. And, and I think that that's, um, that's important, uh, in terms of the, uh, weaknesses, um, I want to pose a question for you because this is something that I found, um, a little bit, uh, tedious for me. Do you think uh, experimental snapshots should be easier to install and or access in the same way that a snapshot is? I honestly want to say no. And it's it's a weird response because obviously I expect they want to make things more accessible to people. But I think the amount of people who are used to the snapshot track now and being able to install a snapshots profile in the launcher... The, the range of people that that covers includes some younger players who might not necessarily understand like the the importance of these being experimental snapshots um and i feel like maybe once you've launched something in the the way that you launch all of your other versions of minecraft it's easier to imagine it being like okay well this is just a feature that they're going to include right there's there's a certain level to which downloading a beta build of the game from the website and having to go back to you know the website in order to do that it kind of works in the same way that jeb was testing the combat snapshots a while back those were effectively the same as these they were experimental builds of the game that included a completely different combat system and we know not when exactly that's going to be implemented if at all and so this is more or less the same thing happening for other mechanics like world generation and and mob spawning and stuff like that so i think it's good to maybe test those with a smaller, more dedicated, and a slightly more savvy community because those are the people who are going to be able to provide the most useful feedback from you. And it seems like a strange way of gating that off. And I do think that it would have been easier for us to manage if we could still access some of the older snapshots once they'd updated the link on that single blog post that they made that updated every time there was a a new version of the snapshot so i think that's one of the problems that's been for me is you know i i see that link update and then i think oh now I, I can't download experimental snapshot build 4 because i just didn't get that at the time i expect it might be archived somewhere but again i have to go looking a little further afield for it um and so yeah, I, I think there's still a couple of issues with that. Maybe if there was a beta track that you could sign up to from your Mojang account on the website or something like that, maybe that would work a little bit better. So you could just kind of get notifications about that instead of having to check the blog posts and know all of the devs on Twitter or read Reddit or any of the other ways they've been 
you know letting people know that there is a new experimental snapshot but i think as far as keeping them separate from the normal snapshot category the proper snapshots uh in big quotes i think that's probably for the best especially considering that there is no compatibility with other worlds and so you couldn't keep these as part of your regular like i'm going to start a snapshot world and update it every time a new snapshot comes out like it doesn't work the same way so i feel like they need to be made distinct in some way and distributing them in a distinct way kind of helps create that distinction yeah and i I agree with you on on weeding out a certain type of feedback like making sure that the people that are giving feedback on the experimental experimental snapshots are the people that also are willing to take the effort to hunt down install and figure out what's going on yeah and i'd imagine that the level of feedback is at a higher bar yeah um, I, I, anecdotal because I, I don't know what that feedback is but th- that's what i would assume right yeah i i expect so it's is you know you're not going to see that many people sort of leaving bug reports on the the bug tracker about like relatively trivial stuff when what they want is more general feedback about this kind of thing um mm-hmm. I, I think in terms of what these experimental snapshots are a, a good thing, like what, what what makes them a good place to test some of this stuff is because you get to test major changes to things like mechanics and world generation. And I, I think those are much broader concepts which are, are better handled by a larger freeform discussion than things like we're adding a new mob to the game. Because I think when it comes to the amount of work that goes into mob design and AI and stuff like that, it seems to work better if things like that are kept internal to the team and the team follows through with their creative vision for it until it seems closer to being a full product that is ready for player testing. We're seeing that now with the Warden, again, because like king b dogs clearly has a vision for this stuff and the team clearly has a vision that they're working on collaboratively for how the Warden operates that now you know we we haven't seen that pop up in an experimental snapshot yet because they don't want to give us an early build of the warden they want to give us something that can feel the way they want it to feel from the beginning and that's not something players need to know about or have a lot of feedback about because then you get players sort of tailoring it to their own experience whereas major changes to mechanics like world generation terrain yeah, broader changes to the sort of biome distribution and, and, and placement of biomes makes sense for players to give feedback on because it's not something that Mojang themselves can test on such a small scale. It doesn't feel as individual as an encounter with a mob when you're looking at how players want their entire world to look and what they expect from the terrain that they encounter every time they load up a new Minecraft world. I think the other really interesting things you can do with testing in experimental snapshots like this are changes to combat which we've already seen with jeb's combat snapshots things like mob spawning have been introduced in these experimental snapshots things like you know mobs only spawning in complete darkness which is seems now pretty broadly accepted as the way it's going to work from now on uh you have things like the mob height uh, the mob spawning not being affected by height at all which is um you know has been rejected by the community it seems like at this stage and is going to feed back into mojang's overall thoughts on how mob spawning should work in future but that's a really important piece of feedback then you could potentially see them workshopping things like physics like should we have more blocks that are affected by gravity or change the way gravity affects those blocks should sand fall much faster or much slower than it currently does like balancing elements like that could be potentially something they do in future experimental snapshots even if they plan on adding different physics to a do and to an environment like the end if they're doing an end update for example there could be an experimental snapshot phase for that update that allows players to tinker with what happens if there is anti-gravity in certain areas of this and stuff floats upwards instead of falling downwards Like, you could do stuff like that in experimental snapshots that wouldn't necessarily guarantee this is going to end up in the game. It's just a place for them to air some of the more out-there ideas that they might have and see the impact of them on the the community. Um, I think if they ever decide to introduce more complex redstone components or to modify the behavior of existing redstone components, an experimental snapshot might end up being the place to do that. Uh, because if they want to add like you know some kind of more interesting redstone circuit um 
I think that'd be a good thing to to have in experimental snapshots and test with a more technical community that's going to respond to that in a way that you know you feel like will touch every part of what this thing can potentially do instead of giving it to a broader player base that's going to have a more general idea and, and just kind of shrug at it and go i don't really know what this does um mm-hmm. and things like terrain even bigger systems like archaeology could end up in an experimental snapshot as long as it's not the key to a whole update theme like if 1.19 was the archaeology update i wouldn't expect them to put archaeology as a system into an experimental snapshot because i'd hope that they were coming to it with more well-developed ideas of how this could be handled but i do think it's interesting that they are starting to test out ideas that affect the game on a broader scale but aren't tied into one specific feature of the update um so i don't expect we'll see you know new blocks and new textures and stuff uh, showcased in experimental snapshots in future because those seem like smaller individual experiences things that don't require a full snapshot just to discuss that one thing and if they are set on adding a new block then that's just something for the regular snapshot track because they know they want to add it in some form or another they just you know want to see what players do with it as a result so i think that's the stuff that they have a greater vision for versus stuff that they would need experimental snapshots for broader player feedback on what would you say would be a weakness of experimental snapshots? I think it's difficult to pinpoint that right now because I think they've been very successful as a system. I think, honestly, it's something that we might end up seeing in future for uh, snapshots that don't end up involving terrain changes is just the fact that you can't keep a persistent world through all of the, all of the different experiments. And again, that's one of the major things I think that separates them from the regular feature snapshots but i i do think um being able to keep a persistent world through a few different changes to say block physics if they decide to touch on that in future that'd be a lot better i think as a an overall approach than forcing us to restart a new world every time especially if a lot of the focus is on testing things in survival because testing stuff in survival for these experimental snapshots i've had to start from okay, let me give myself a stone pickaxe, you know, mm-hmm. for, and, and and craft a ton of stuff and then make my way into the underground. And, you know, you're playing for maybe a week, presuming you can play in that world in a dedicated fashion before they've released another experimental snapshot and you have to abandon that world entirely to see what is new. Um, so I think that's probably the major drawback of these ones, but you can see why that's been a factor with this series because it's so focused on the changes to terrain and you need to be able to see what is different about these newer worlds when they change the terrain each time and with no guaranteed way of seeing how far you have explored unless you were tracking that beforehand you couldn't load up an older world with newer terrain generation and immediately pinpoint what had changed i think you really need to either do a side-by-side comparison of that or you need to be starting a new world each time with the same seed and just looking at it and thinking, was that mountain there before? Was that area made out of terracotta? Is it now back to being dirt and stone? Like, was that a snow-capped mountain before that is now a, you know, an ice-capped mountain or a stony peaks or something like that? I think it's the kind of thing they couldn't do at all with this snapshot series for good reason, but I would like to see future snapshots be something that you could roll into the next one and the next one and the next one so that the survival experience can last a bit longer in that world uh shepherd in our live chat is saying that redstone changes in technical community you know they put a lot of time into building a contraption to then test and stress test those changes to not be able to move that experimental snapshot into another experimental snapshot it would be a huge problem because yeah. then you'd have to rebuild the whole thing all over again exactly uh, but yeah and, and that's the kind of environment that you would expect them to do something as li- like an experimental snapshot so that they aren't freaking out the entire redstone community by saying okay redstone is going to fundamentally change now mm-hmm. it's, it's like um a while back when they changed piston behavior a couple of times so that piston pistons back in like the 1.9 update uh pistons suddenly started pulling entities through them when they retracted so uh, you know an armor stand that was on one side of a piston could get pushed and then it would be pulled through to the other side of a piston and i expect changes like that would be a lot more you know they get a lot more positive feedback on stuff like that if it was workshopped in an experimental setting beforehand 
and they had people saying, you know, this is really good for this, but not so good for that. And the overall question was, should Pistons do this? Um, I think you're going to get a lot more constructive feedback on things like that. Likewise, you know, it wasn't a huge change, but the changes to the way redstone dots behave, having the cross shape and then the, the single dot shape and redstone redirecting into certain components and things like that, if they want to introduce stuff like that. And it's stuff that also contributes to parity with Bedrock Edition because... In Bedrock Edition currently, a lot of redstone reroutes into components like pistons, which it doesn't on Java. If they want to really get some feedback from the technical community on how some of that stuff should change and what some likely alternatives are, then experimental snapshots seem like a good environment to do that without saying, we are committed to changing this permanently and then having to then go back on their word a few snapshots later when they realize that you know, people weren't happy with that as a change. I think it's good to have a a sandbox within a sandbox, I suppose, if you want to if you want to see it that way. One last thing that I want to add, because I know we're running a little bit long in in the communication realm, uh, I would prefer a new blog post every time they do an experimental snapshot. Uh, we get clear blog posts, even for the smaller, proper snapshots, even when they're just bug fixes, it's still a new post. And I think the experimental snapshots would be easier to track, specifically on the publication date, uh, as well as the changes. I think it would be a lot easier to digest having separate blog posts for each experimental snapshot. And it's fine if there's two or three in a week, just let it rip. You know, I think it's, it's more important to have that consistency. Uh, from a, a UI standpoint, I'd like the blog posts to be easier to find from the Mojang website too. I feel like it should be a lot easier to find them rather than trying to find a dev tweet and, and click the link. Um, sometimes they're front on center on the news, but you can't just go into a blog and kind of like see everything, at least not that I can find on a main main mm-hmm. link on the, web, on the website. Um, I do, however, like the language of changes of X compared to Y, you know, changes in experimental snapshot seven when compared to six, rather than rehashing all of the changes, we're just yeah. going to talk about what we've changed moving forward. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, you could include links in the blog post to the previous experimental snapshots if people wanted to deep dive and read what's happened before. Uh, but I think better organization from the communication standpoint would probably facilitate even more quality feedback. I think one one last thing before we wrap up here. My uh my my only piece of feedback on that score would be we need to come up with either as a community or maybe the devs themselves need to prompt us to come up with a shorter way of saying experimental snapshot <laughs> because like yeah. I've been abbreviating it to ES a couple of times like ES1 ES6 and so forth but I I don't know if anybody else is doing the same thing and experimental snapshot is a mouthful to say when you have to say it multiple times per video or per podcast so please before we do another round of these let's give them some other kind of uh, classification that doesn't quite involve that many syllables Uh, but that wraps up our other syllables for this week that's going to be it for this episode of the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff we've talked about today at thespawnchunks.com the music for the show is composed by me and the spawn chunks is proud as ever to be a listener supported podcast if you're getting some value out of the show please consider putting some value back in you can do that at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks where joining our community will get you an invite to our patrons only discord chat it gets us closer to our next goal of having a monthly minecraft audio hangout with our discord community we are currently at 284 patrons which is up three from last week thank you to everybody who's hopped on board lately and special thanks to our content engineer patrons general pattern 82 hunter 555 jumbo sale and yitz for your support on this episode Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on Twitter and Instagram. Personal recommendations are by far the best way to share the podcast. Just poke a friend in the arm from a safe distance, looking at you, I know who you are, and tell them to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Really, wherever you can find a podcast, you can find The Spawn Chunks. We had a number of people actually ask this week if it's on Spotify. It is. Just go look for it. You can email the show at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Please use that email address. The RSS feed is linked on the spawnchunks.com, and the Patreon-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the render distance the extended version of the podcast 
My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixelriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixelriffs, where my Empire's SMP and Hardcore Survival Guide series are currently ongoing. You can also find all of my previous thoughts on each of these experimental snapshots. I stream three days a week on Twitch, where I do behind-the-scenes work for the aforementioned YouTube series, and I'm also the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search. Aside from that, I'm at Pixelriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything I am up to online, including my illustration and design portfolio, is at joelduggan.com. You can find links to the other podcast work that I do there, including the Sizzle Cafe, which is at the sizzlecafe.com, my podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. This past week, Stephen and I talked about the What If series on Disney+, Plus, which is about Marvel alternate universes and alternate endings. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media and at Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I am playing a lot of Satisfactory this week because thanks to the incredible community around my streams, we have unlocked the Satisfactory World Tour. That's going to be happening this week. Follow me on Twitter. You'll find out when and join the stream. It's going to be a explanation heavy video of where I am in the game so far. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite and it's still experimental.